to proceed. Uh, today, inshallah, we will talk about, we will end the, the book of jihad, inshallah, and we will talk about uh, post war. Uh, because what Imam Ibn Qudama did, and that's usually the way it is uh, arranged or organized, is that he started by discussing the ruling of jihad and uh, the rules of engagement. So first the ruling of jihad, then the rulings of engagement, and then uh, the discussion in the last two chapters will be about um, the asylum, granting asylum, and the following one will be about aqd al-zimma wa ahkam ahl al-zimma. So the last one will be about the contract or the covenant that will be extended after the end of jihad or after the end of the war uh, to, to the people. Um, the options that will be extended to them and uh, the, the contract of the covenant. So, Bab al Aman or the chapter on. Aman means what? Literally, it means security, to grant security, to grant asylum. Uh, it is a subsection of Hud, uh, of, of Zimma, Aqd al Zimma. Aqd al Zimma is offered by the Imam. Uh, or the deputies of the Imam. A man can be offered by any individual Muslim. Uh, so it is a form of a contract that is not necessarily offered by the Imam and his deputies, but could be offered by any individual Muslim. It is a form of aqd zimma but not the aqd zimma that is offered by uh, the Imam uh, or the uh, Sultan, etc. So, Bab al Aman, which is chapter on uh, security, offering or granting security or granting uh, asylum. Uh, and then the next one will be. Uh, the chapter on uh, the covenant uh, that is extended to the people. So, talked about the ruling of jihad, talked about the rulings of engagement, all of them. And then, immediate, post war, immediately post war, would be the distribution of war spoils or um, booty. Uh, with that which was acquired by fighting or in, uh, through engagement, and that which was acquired without engagement and fight, uh, and, and so on. And the, the distribution, that's immediately post-war. But after that, uh, you extend the contract, you extend different options to the people that have been uh, uh, the, the, your, uh, the, the enemies, uh, you know, the warring or combatant uh, uh, enemy. Uh, so let us. Uh, so now we will. Well, now we're post-war. Now we're done with the ruling of jihad, rulings of engagement, distribution of uh, the war booty, and now we're post-war. We're talking about, you know, how we are dealing with the enemy uh, that was engaged uh, in war against us. Uh, so he, he says here, Bab al Aman, Imam ibn Qudama, who died in the year 620 after Hijrah in his book Al Umda, which is a Hanbali primer. He says under the uh, book of Jihad or the segment on Jihad, he uh, says, Bab al Aman, chapter on granting security and asylum. Uh, he starts by saying, وَمَنْ قَالَ لِحَرْبِيٍ قَدْ أَجَرْتُكَ أَوْ أَمَّنْتُكَ أَوْ لَا بَأَسَ عَلَيْكَ uh, whoever says to a harbi, I grant you asylum or security, uh, or you shall not be harmed or the like, uh, has bindingly given him security. Has bindingly uh, given him security. Whoever says to a harbi, I grant you asylum or security, or you shall not be harmed or the like, or the like. Uh, or the like, meaning what? Any indication, anything uh, by which the, the, the harbi, the warring enemy, 
uh, uh, basically understands uh, that he had been given security or asylum will be binding on us. Anything that has, can be possibly interpreted to mean security will be binding on us. To the point that they said, even if that asylum does not, you know, it is a shubhat aman, and keep in mind that, that this is something that is established. Even if it is a shubhat aman, you will have to return him safely to uh, basically where he came from, uh, to, uh, to safety. He, you will have to return him to safety. Uh, if he suspected uh, that you have given them, uh, if they suspected that you have given them security, uh, but you actually did not, and what you said would not mean security, or you are not eligible to give them security in the first place, if they are under the impression, and this is something that is established in our fiqh, uh, and we have to keep in mind, if they are under the impression, shubhatul amani aman, if they are under the impression that they have security, then they should be returned to safety. They should be returned to safety. So that's the first thing he started by, uh, and like I told you, Bab al-Aman, or the chapter of security, granting security or granting asylum, uh, is uh, related to Bab Aqd al-Zimma, or the contract or the, of the covenant uh, that we will discuss, inshallah, in the next session. Then Imam ibn Qudama proceeds uh, to saying, وَيَصِحُّ الْأَمَانُ مِنْ كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ عَاقِلٍ مُخْتَارٍ حُرًّا كَانَ أَوْ عَبْدًا رَجُلًا أَوْ امْرَأَةً لِقَوْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم المؤمنون تتكافأ دماؤهم ويسعى بذمتهم أدناهم uh, He did not mention that the rest of the hadith. It, it is an authentic hadith reported uh, by uh, Abi Dawood uh, and the Nasa'i and others. Uh, which means, uh, you know, what, what Imam Ibn Qudama says here uh, uh, means granting security is valid by every willing, sane, Muslim, uh, whether free or slave, man or woman, because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the blood of Muslims is equal, that is in qisas or retribution and blood money, the right of protection granting asylum uh, is extended to uh, the lowest among them, this right, this power to grant asylum, is extended to the lowest among them. The lowest meaning the lowest in status, in um, worldly status, uh, would still be uh, entitled to the right of granting asylum. This is never fine in the world, by the way. Like anyone can grant asylum uh, to a warring enemy. Keep in mind, we're talking here about what? Warring enemy. We're talking about giving asylum, giving security to a warring enemy. Okay. So we're talking here about giving asylum uh, or security to a warring uh, enemy. Uh, and in this case, it, it, that right, uh, that entitlement, is given to all people, including uh, children, no, not children, you know, some of the scholars said children even, but including, you know, male, female, free, and slave, anyone can uh, give asylum to, uh, anyone can give asylum to a, the, the warring enemy. So, what is the proof on this? The hadith of al mu'minun tatakafa'u dima'uhum wa yasa'a bi dhimmatihim adnahum Muslims, or the blood of Muslims is equal, the right to protection or granting asylum is extended to the lowest among uh, them. Uh, the proof also that this is extended to everyone, uh, including women, 
is why why do we say including women? Because women are not involved in you know are not primarily, although they may be sometimes involved in the war uh, as combatants, but they are not uh, usually involved in the war as combatants. So you would think that the people who would be able to give to extend that right uh, or to extend that. Uh, uh, the right to security or asylum would be the people who were involved in combat, but it is not limited to them. Uh, a man came to the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi A mushrik uh, uh, sought asylum in Ummahana's residence. She came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and she said to him. Uh, that Ali uh, claims that he would, that he has the right to kill that person to whom I have given asylum. The Prophet Sallallahu said to her, Ajarna man ajarti ya ummahana. We have given asylum to whomever you give, you have given asylum to, O ummahana. So she uh, basically was given that uh, right, the right of uh, protection. Now, then, given that this right is extended to all Muslims, the right of protection is extended to all Muslims, can a Muslim basically come and say, well, I have given the right of protection to uh, China? <laughs> you know, for instance. Uh, then he will come back and discuss this and he says, وَأَصِحُّ أَمَانُ أَحَادِ الرَّعَيَّةِ لِلْجَمَاعَةِ الْيَسِيرَةِ وَأَمَانُ الْأَمِيرِ لِلْبَلَدِ الَّذِي أُقِيمَ بِإِزَائِهِ وَأَمَانُ الْإِمَامِ لِجَمِيعِ الْكُفَّارِ وَمَنْ دَخَلَ دَارَهُمْ بِأَمَانِهِمْ فَقَدْ أَمَّنَهُمْ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ the asylum, is, the asylum is valid if granted by individual subjects to the Muslim state uh, to small groups. So they are given them asylum, you can come into the Muslim state, two small groups. By the commander to the state, he was commissioned to fight, or by the imam uh, or khalifa to all unbelievers. Whomever enters their land with their promise of security will have in turn given them a binding promise of security, will have in turn given them abiding promise uh, of security from him. So now, so you have, you have an individual uh, Muslim, individual uh, Muslim can give asylum, an individual Muslim can give asylum to they say one up to 100. Uh, so an individual Muslim can give an as asylum to like a kafila or a caravan, up to 100 people. Uh, and then they, uh, they say, what about the, uh, let, let, let us presume that the caliphate is like the federal government and then the states, you know, uh, you have the governors and then you have the president. What about a governor, uh, an emir, emir, emir that is emir of combat or emir of a particular province next uh, to uh, sort of the uh, Dar al Harb or the abode of war? And as we said before, all the abodes now are abodes of conciliation uh, because of the uh, international agreements and so on. But let us say it's an abode of war. So that governor or the emir of combat would be able to give asylum, asylum to uh, basically the town next to them or the land uh, immediately adjacent to them or to the town or the hasn, uh, basically that they were in, uh, engaged in combat against. What about the Khalifa? The Khalifa would be able to give asylum to what? All unbelievers. All unbelievers. So that's it. One, two, three. That's
So uh, then the Sheikh says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَ دَارَهُمْ بِأَمَانِهِمْ فَقَدْ أَمَّنَهُمْ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ Whoever enters their land with their promise of security will have in turn given them a binding promise of security from him. So if you apply for a visa, the, you know, it's a warring state. We're saying that the default for all nations nowadays is that it's Dar Sulh, abode of conciliation, Dar Ahd, abode of treaty, etc. Let us say it's a warring state, but they granted you a visa. Uh, then you have to respect that and uh, just accepting the visa from them means automatically that you have been party to a contract, that you have, that you are uh, in a contract now with them uh, which requires uh, basically uh, um, to be honored, to be fulfilled, um, and requires no treachery or uh, treason. Uh, this means what? It means that their blood, their property will be inviolable, although they, it's not harb. Although, by default, they are engaged in war, or they are at war with the Muslims. They are at war with the Muslims. But you have been granted security to come into their land. In this case, for you, it is not the, the, the rulings of Dar al would not apply, because the, you have been given security, therefore, that security means that you have also uh, given them uh, security or the promise of security, meaning that their blood and their property is inviolable. Then the Sheikh says, وَإِنْ خَلَّوْا أَسِيرًا مِنَّا بِشَرْتِ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ إِلَيْهِمْ مَعْلُومًا لَازِمَهُ الْوَفَاءَ لَهُمْ فَإِنْ شَرَطَ or شَرَطُوا عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَعُودَ إِلَيْهِمْ إِنْ عَجَزَ عَنْهُ لَازِمَهُ الْعَوْدِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ امرأة فَلَا تَرْجَعَ إِلَيْهِمْ If they release a Muslim captive on condition that he sends them a certain amount of money, is required to fulfill his promise. If they stipulate as a condition that he must return to them if he fails to fulfill his promise, he must do so, except for a woman who does not, who does not return to them. She, would, she should not return to them. So now you, if you are a captive and uh, you tell, uh, you know, uh, your... Um, sort of uh, guards or whoever has taken you captive that let me go, I will come back. Uh, let me go and I will send you my ransom. Just let me go, I will send you my ransom. Uh, you know, uh, you're required to send them the ransom because this is a binding promise. Although they are a warring enemy, but this is a binding promise. You are actually required to send them the ransom. So what if you were unable to collect the ransom? You're required to go back to them. Basically, put, put your hands in, in handcuffs uh, and just uh, be a captive one more time. The only exception is for women, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Return them not, return them not to the disbelievers. Uh, keep in mind that, at, you know, during those times uh, when, you know, women who were taken captive, uh, they were enslaved, and then she would have, this would, would necessarily mean uh, allowing people to, um, to uh, have power over uh, the women. And everybody knows what happens then. Uh, then, then the Sheikh, so, so this, is, this is that, this is this discussion. 
it's quite clear and it's a sort of, uh, you know, the, uh, being principled here, uh, it's quite clear that, you, you, that you're given more weight here to uh, deontological ethics versus theological ethics. Uh, you're being very principled here, very uh, sort of categorical uh, imperative, Kantian categorical imperative type ethics. But when it comes to women, when it comes to women, uh, then we go back and sort of uh, factor in that teleological aspect or utilitarian aspect. Uh, as we, as, as I have said before, you, evil is not all equal, good is not all equal, and it's a balance. So this man going back to captivity because he could not basically collect the ransom that is being Kantian. It's just categorical imperatives. Like you give, you give, you've given a promise. You can't break your promise. Go back to captivity. So now, if it is a woman, yes, we are, we are principled, but at the same time, we do recognize that evil comes in grades, and a woman uh, allowing someone power over her uh, is, is worse than a man allowing uh, another man power over them. You know, at the end of the day, if the man goes back to captivity, dies in, in jail, or gets beaten, or anything of that nature, again, we are prioritizing here uh, you know, that commitment to uh, the promise. Um, don't breach your uh, promise. Don't break your promise. But for the woman, it's a different story. So you see that Islamic ethics would have both features, the ontological, teleological, with a capstone of virtual ethics as well. Uh, and it's all obvious here, just that distinction between the man and the woman, forcing the man to go back to captivity if he's in, unable to collect the ransom would look very uh, categorical. Uh, telling the woman, don't go back, even if you gave them a promise, looks very teleological or basically utilitarian or uh, purpose-based uh, or end-based uh, type ethics. The, the difference is, Evil is not all equal. Good is not all equal. The man going back to captivity is not like the woman going back to captivity. Okay. Truces and treaties uh, with the unbelievers. Uh, so we're still talking here about a man, but um, now we're just moving to al Hudna and uh, I wish he had talked about migration before truces and treaties because truces and treaties belongs to Amal al Imam, you know, it belongs to the authority or the jurisdiction of the Imam that we will come to in the next chapter, which is the chapter on Aqd al Zimma, that, that, the, the contract of the covenant uh, that you extend to the uh, warring enemy. But he, he talks here about truces and treaties with the unbelievers. Uh, and he says, First, وَتَجُوزُ مُهَادَنَةُ الْكُفَّارِ إِذَا رَأَى الْإِمَامُ الْمَصْلَحَةَ فِيهَا وَلَا يَجُوزُ عَقْدُهَا إِلَّا مِنَ الْإِمَامُ أَوْ نَائِبِهِ وَعَلَيْهِ حِمَايَتُهُمْ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ دُونَ أَهْلِ الْحَرْبِ وَإِنْ خَافَ نَقْضَ الْعَهْدِ مِنْهُمْ نَبَذَ إِلَيْهِمْ عَهْدَهُمْ وَإِنْ سَبَاهُمْ كُفَّارٌ آخَرُونَ لَمْ يَجُزْ لَنَا شِرَاؤُهُمْ Okay, so the first segment here is وَتَجُوزُ مُهَادَنَةُ الْكُفَّارِ إِذَا رَأَى الْإِمَامُ الْمَصْلَحَةَ فِيهَا وَلَا يَجُوزُ عَقْدُهَا إِلَّا مِنَ الْإِمَامُ أَوْ نَائِبِهِ It is permissible to have truces with the unbelievers if the imam or caliph finds it beneficial. But this may only be agreed by uh, the imam or his deputy. So uh, the, that contract, that treaty can only be signed and ratified by the imam and his deputies. If, of course. I mean, it's good enough that an individual Muslim is able to give asylum up to 100 people of the warring enemy. You know, that's, that's almost like a special forces unit. Uh, so 
your, the individual Muslim is able to, to give asylum up to that number, uh, certainly if, if there is, you know, um, certainly the individual Muslim should not do this, if this would bring about harm uh, to the Muslims, of course. Uh, but we're saying that this is as much as a, well, an individual Muslim is given. But then, when it comes to offering a truce or a treaty of peace, then it is the business of the imam and the deputies of the imam, the state, the authorities. That's their business. And then, then we come to the concept of al-hudna. We come to the concept of al-hudna or peace treaties. And in the concept of al-hudna or peace treaties, you will find that there is a disagreement about al-hudna al-mutlaqa, hudna that is untimed. The hudna al-mutlaqa, the untimed hudna, would make the default between the states is what is one of what? Peace. Because it's hudna mutlaqa. It's untimed. There is a treaty, a peace treaty, between us. That's like the UN Charter. You know, this is a peace treaty. It's not bilateral. It is multilateral, right? Peace treaty, multilateral. The default between uh, states is peace. That hudna mutlaqa, untimed hudna, is permissible according to the Hanafis. It is also the choice of Ibn Taymiyyah. So Imam Ibn Taymiyyah that is not the, the, the position of the Hanbalis. The authorized position in the Hanbali madhab is that the hudna has to be timed. That also happened to be the position of the majority. But in the Hanafi madhab, and I will basically say that Hanafis were basically, during the time of the, the, the during this phase of, of evolution of fiqh, the Hanafis were uh, the official sort of uh, state muftis and judges and so on and so forth. This is all Abb Abbasi, right? You know, if you, if you think about it, the Umayyad period ended in 132 after Hijra. Uh, the blossoming of Hanafi fiqh happened between that time and 150, which is the time of the death of Imam Abu Hanifa. The blossoming of the Maliki Madhab happened, you know, M mainly between that time and 179, the time of the death of Imam uh, Malik. Imam al-Shafi'i was born in 150, was born after the Umayyad dynasty ended. Uh, the, uh, Imam Ahmad was born in 164 after Hijra. Well, he was born during the time of Harun al-Rashid. This is well after the Umayyad dynasty ended. This is all Abbasi business. Now that, you know, this is all happening in the Abbasi uh, merely like uh, 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 atmosphere under the Abbasi rule. Who were the judges at the time and the muftis of the state at the time? Uh, because the, the, you have to keep in mind that they internalize uh, practical aspects that may not be internalized by other muftis. Because these practical aspects, they're actually given fatwas to the state so the Hanafis were mindful of these practical aspects because they are the people that are given fatwa to the state. Uh, who was the chief judge during the time of Harun al-Rashid? Abu Yusuf. Um, okay, so now, so the Hanafis said that uh, like an untimed, open-ended hudna or peace treaty is permissible is permissible. And this was the choice of uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, as uh, we uh, said, uh, which changes the default from war to uh, peace. But then the Sheikh says here, the Sheikh does not talk about timed or untimed here, but I want you to be aware that the Hanbari position is like the Jumhur's position. It has to be timed. Uh, then the Sheikh says here, وَعَلَيْهِ حِمَايَتُهُمْ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ دُونَ أَهْلِ الْحَرْبِ He, the Imam, must then protect them, those unbelievers, with whom there is a truce uh, from Muslims, but not from the other warring uh, enemies. He must protect them from Muslims, but not from other 
warring enemies. So he will protect them. This is a, basically a country with whom there is peace, uh, but this is, not, this is not under our jurisdiction. So we don't have to protect them from other countries. We just protect them from ourselves. But not only from Muslims, but also from non-Muslim subjects within, uh, you know, the, or under the Islamic jurisdiction. So the imam has to protect them from everyone under his jurisdiction once he signs a peace treaty with them. A peace treaty with them. So that means what? Like we can't have rogue organizations waging war because uh, whichever jurisdiction they belong to, that imam, if that imam is involved in a peace treaty with the other countries, then that imam is responsible uh, not only for his actions, but for uh, the actions of his subjects uh, in, within his territory under uh, his jurisdiction. So that has to be understood. وَعَلَيْهِ حِمَيَاتُهُمْ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ دُونَ أَهْلِ الْحَرْبِ He, uh, the imam, must then protect them uh, from Muslims, uh, but not from the other warring uh, enemies. And then the Sheikh says, وَإِنْ خَافَ نَقْضَ الْعَهْدِ مِنْهُمْ نَبَذَ إِلَيْهِمْ عَهْدَهُمْ If he fears that they will breach the contract, he must openly terminate, uh, terminate it. Uh, he must openly terminate it. Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal, وَإِمَّا تَقَفَنَّ مِنْ قَوْمٍ خِيَانَ فَانْبِذْ إِلَيْهِمْ عَلَى سَوَاءٍ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الخائنين. And if you fear treachery from people, then cast uh, back their covenant or their contract to them, throw it back at them. Uh, سواء. سواء here means so that you and them are equally aware of the termination of the contract. Don't do it without being transparent about it. Just throw it back at them if you fear treachery. If they have shown you signs of treachery, throw it back and then so that you and them are equally aware of the termination of the contract for Allah likes not uh, the traitors. Um, and, and this is, you know, uh, part of the sort of the uh, foundations of the Islamic value system, uh, no treachery. وَإِنْ سَبَعْهُمْ كُفَّارٌ آخَرُونَ لَمْ يَجُزْ لَنَا شِرَاؤُهُمْ If they are taken into captivity by other, unbelief, by other unbelievers, uh, it is not permissible for the Muslims to purchase them. So let us say you, are, you have a peace treaty now with one country, and as I said, the default in all, in all lands now, um, I repeat the stuff to avoid the cut and paste, the sort of the uh, ugly cut and paste. Um, so uh, the default between all countries is the state of conciliation, صلح, treaty, not uh, war, uh, based on the UN charters and so on. But let us say it, we're, we're, we're back during those times, uh, and then there are three countries here. There are two non-Muslim countries, and there is one Muslim country. So that Muslim country gave uh, uh, basically a contract of peace to country Y, that is non-Muslim. Then country X, which is non-Muslim, invades country Y and takes country Y's subjects into captivity and enslaves them. We can't purchase them, uh, even from country X, uh, because we have already uh, given them that, extended to them that uh, covenant. Okay, then moving right on to the next subject, which is extremely pertinent to us, isn't it? Yes. Then the Sheikh says, وَتَجِبُ الْهِجْرَ عَلَى مَنْ لَمْ يَقْدِرْ عَلَى إِظْهَارِ دِينِهِ فِي دَارِ الْحَرْبِ وَتُسْتَحَبُ لِمَنْ قَدَرَ عَلَى ذَلِكِ وَلَا تَنْقَطِعُ الْهِجْرَ مَا قُوتِلَ الْكُفَّارِ إِلَّا مِنْ بَلَدٍ بَعْدَ فَتْحِهِ 
Uh, I titled this Migration to the Land of Islam. Hijra or migration is mandatory for those who cannot openly practice their religion. Cannot openly practice their religion in the abode of war. And it is recommended for those who can. It is recommended for those who can. Hijra does not end as long as the unbelievers are being fought except from a district after uh, its successful conquest. You, you don't have to migrate from Mecca after Mecca was conquered. Of, of course, it's, you know, it's now a Muslim land. Uh, so you don't have to migrate fr from it. So la hijrat abad al-fatih. Okay, so the sheikh here uh, says clearly that migration is mandatory from Dar al-Harb. I have to... Uh, it's, an, it's, it's another sort of um, pointer here. We're talking about Dar al Harb. Uh, you know, Muslims, Muslim minorities in our times are mostly not in Dar al Harb. They are in Dar al Ahd or al Salih. Whether he's talking about a by uh, sort of uh, a two pronged classification here or a three-pronged classification, it's beside the point, but even if he's talking about two-pronged classification, that this Dar al-Harb is Dar al-Harb even with uh, a peace treaty that is not at war now with the Muslims. Uh, so he's talking about, you know, let's say he's not talking about Dar al-Harb altogether, he's talking about Dar al-Kufr, non-Muslim lands. He's just talking about non-Muslim lands. He's saying that migration is mandatory from non-Muslim lands if you're unable to practice your religion openly. And so, so this is the position of the majority. The majority would require migration for those who are unable to practice their religion openly. I would say uh, there are those who require people to make a hijrah to the land of Islam. Uh, I would say that the position of the majority is, is probably the stronger position based on the hadith and based on many things, you know. The, uh, after the establishment of the land of Islam, the Sahaba and Habasha were not asked to come back, except very later, um, uh, you know, and the land of Islam was established when? You know, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ immigrated to Medina. Uh, that was the state. And then it took the Sahaba several years to come back from Al Habasha, which means that it is not mandatory for people who are able to practice their deen. And this is a, you know, I'm, I'm just particularly citing this because, you know, this is a big thing. This is a confirmed part of the history and it's a big thing. And it is not just history because this happened during the time of the Prophet وسلم, and it is quite pertinent uh, versus talking about hadith and then talking about controversy over the authenticity of the hadith or this hadith or that hadith and so on, but this is a quite obvious thing. You know, the Prophet ﷺ did not demand them to come back from al-Habasha when he established his own state. So, uh, because they were able to practice their religion openly. Now, if someone fears for themselves or their progeny, their posterity, then they, need, they have to leave if they fear that they will not be able to practice their religion openly. Their posterity will not be able to practice their religion. There are signs that uh, there is an impending uh, threat uh, that uh, we will not be able to practice our religion openly. In this case, people ought to emigrate. Uh, up until then, it is recommended uh, to migrate to the land of Islam, and that is a point of agreement between the scholars, but when you say recommended, then th there are other factors to be considered here, other sort of benefit-risk uh, assessment to be uh, considered, or benefit-harm assessment to be considered. This, I mean, some may factor in the benefit of da'wah in non-Muslim lands, uh, the benefit of having Islamic presence uh, in non-Muslim lands, uh, the personal benefit for the Muslim minorities who live in non-Muslim lands, and some practical and pragmatic aspects also 
uh, because some Muslim minorities uh, are not just limited to a few thousand, few hundred thousand, or a few million people. There are some Muslim minorities that, you know, uh, are a lot more than that. You could have a Muslim minority of 200 million people. That's basically a minority that is bigger than 30 Muslim countries combined together. So in this case, you cannot say to them, just emigrate. Uh, because that, that will have consequences, not just for these people, but also for the presence of Islam in these lands. Islam would be retracting, withdrawing, retreating, uh, and mm, certainly no one would say this to a minority of 200 million people. Uh, it's just impractical. Uh, but like I said, the, the concept basically is quite obvious. People are able to practice their religion openly. They can stay, like the Sahaba stayed in Habasha after the Prophet emigrated to Medina for several years. It is recommended for them to leave. That's a general recommendation. Other considerations would have to be uh, factored in um, that are collective considerations and individual uh, considerations. Uh, but uh, where once they, f uh, that they feel uh, they have concern about being able to practice the religion openly or pos their posterity being able to practice the religion openly, then it would go back to being compulsory on them uh, to emigrate. And I think that this would bring us to the end of this chapter, it's one of the shorter ones, the chapter on granting security and asylum to people. And in summary of this chapter, he talked about many things. He talked about asylum being, you know, the right to or the right of protection uh, being given or granted to individual Muslims, um, males and females, uh, free and slave. Any one of them can give asylum to, uh, you know, a group of disbelievers, that's, you know, up to 100 uh, disbelievers, uh, then the right of asylum can be given by a state governor or like an emir of, uh, of combat to uh, a particular town or a particular district, and the right of asylum can be given to all unbelievers by uh, the Khalifa. Um, then we talked about uh, whoever enters their land, that's the land of warring enemy, uh, with their promise of security, will have in turn given them a binding promise of security. Then we talked about the, the, the captive uh, and, you know, uh, not, 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 you know, honoring, fulfilling our contracts, even if that means going back to captivity. Uh, and we talked about the exception of women here. Then we talked about truce and treaties with the unbelievers and truce that is timed, truce that is untimed. And we said untimed means making the default peace. That's the Hanafi position, choice of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. And then we talked about uh, hijrah or uh, emigrating uh, to the land of Islam. And we said it is binding on those who are unable to practice the religion openly, recommended for everyone, but also with uh, other considerations uh, that will affect the benefit uh, harm uh, assessment.